Sega is a beloved treasure within the video game industry. They're behind one of the most well-known icons in video games, and their range of IPs is just about impressive. There's a good reason why Sega has always been perceived as one of the stronger publishers in the industry. But what if I told you that the games they're known for today were facing a really rocky period? What if I told you at one point we wouldn't possibly get a localized Yakuza game or even seeing 3D Sonic at its last straw? How did Sega rebound from all of these problems? We're going to talk about the fall and rise of Sega as we know it. This wouldn't be a Sega video without talking about the video game icon that put them on the map, Sonic the Hedgehog. Sonic, he enjoyed a golden age of successive games throughout the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis era, but a Sonic team took to experiment with new IPs like Nights into Dreams and Burning Rangers with the Sega Saturn, Sonic took a backseat. At one point, it was going to finally progress towards the age of 3D or Sonic Extreme, the one game that could have actually sold Sega Saturns after that console's disastrous reveal and price announcement in the US, but it was ultimately cancelled. Sonic wouldn't enter the 3D realm until the launch of Sega's final console, the Dreamcast. Sonic Adventure was a turning point for the series in its transition to 3D. The entire cast of Sonic's characters, from Sonic himself to Dr. Eggman, they all received redesigns for the game. With the move to 3D, Sonic Team realised it needed to really replicate that sense of speed the 2D games had achieved back then. The stages had to be eye-catching and bristlingly fast enough to play through, and it would be a chance to show each character's story unfold individually. The result? They knocked it right out of the park. Sonic Adventure became that must-have game for the Dreamcast to the point where it is the console's best-selling game. But it sadly wasn't enough to keep the console alive in the long term, a Sega contended with the prospect of bankruptcy, the fact that not only would they have to compete with Sony, but also with Nintendo and Microsoft who were about to enter into the console market, and not to mention the infighting between Sega executives over whether to keep themselves in the console business. I think it goes without saying that something is seriously wrong when the heads of all of your studios walk out in disgust at the prospect of waving the white flag. Nevertheless, Sega stopped making consoles entirely and moved to third party game development. But that didn't stop them from making a sequel to Sonic Adventure, which was a turning point in that it introduced one of the series most iconic characters in Shadow the Hedgehog, and it refined some of the mechanics that were developed in Adventure well, minus the terrible 3D camera and all of Knuckles stages. Trust me, the only thing that keeps it going is that banger soundtrack. It was also not only the final Sonic game for Sega's own console, but also the very first Sonic game for a Nintendo home console. The idea of Sonic releasing on Nintendo hardware, it was seen as blasphemy for its time, but this was Sega's survival run. So they had to make sacrifices and this is the result. More people got to experience the games that didn't hit these consoles for years. The quality of Sonic's 3D games started to go all over the place with the release of Sonic Heroes, a game that emphasised teamwork in its gameplay, but failed to fix some of the technical problems that the adventure games had suffered from. This was also the first Sonic game to release on the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox. Sony's insistence on getting Sonic Heroes to be released on the PS2 at all costs meant that Sega would have to use an entirely new engine to facilitate multi-platform development. In this case, they used renderware, or they'd be barred from ever publishing on Sony's consoles again. It also brought in immense development challenges to the point where one of these series creative directors, Takashi Izuka, he crunched for hours and end to fix the game's level design. The next year, Shadow the Hedgehog was released to pretty negative reception all around. It was supposed to build on Shadow's character, whilst also turning the core Sonic 3D gameplay and storyline into a grittier, more mature experience for the outset. But I guess that doesn't matter when your homing attack and level design causes your game to have a skill issue, I guess. Damn. Sonic Team went back to the drawing board, looking to create a game that would do the Sonic series justice for a new generation of consoles. They'd felt that despite their work with 6th generation consoles, the reveals of the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 were promising enough to take on a new era for Sonic. This is where Sonic 06 came to be conceived. It was going to be a new direction for the series, 
or so it was supposed to. Sonic 06 suffered from immense development problems towards the end. Despite the game initially receiving praise and previews, behind the scenes, things weren't quite as stable within Sonic Team. Yuji Naku, one of the co-creators of the Sonic series, left the studio in March 2006 to set up a new development team named Probe. Sega had also put the team with tight deadlines that seriously affected the game's quality in such a negative way. It was supposed to release on every 7th generation console, but ultimately, Sega split Sonic Team into two teams. One would be working on Sonic 06, whilst the other would be working on Sonic and the Secret Rings for the Wii. The Wii proved to be a far less powerful console than initially thought, and porting Sonic 06 would have taken far more time to compromise for the Wii's limitations. The PlayStation 3 on the other hand, also proved to be a difficult console to develop for, and with its release fast approaching, Sonic Team opted to skip up bug testing and QA reports to get the game out in time for the series 15th anniversary. This resulted in the Sonic series receiving its worst entry yet critically. It was a buggy mess all around and even trying to explore the hub worlds would result in constant loading screens all around, and it was far worse if you had the PSD version. Sonic 06 also is infamous for having one of the worst moments of the series by far. I'm not even going to bother talking about it, seeing this on screen was cringeworthy enough. The reputation of the Sonic series in terms of overall game quality suffered as a result of Sonic 06's critical failure. Sega tried to delist games that fell behind a certain meta score to ensure the quality of Sonic games wasn't compromised. Later games like Sonic Unleashed and Generations did their best to try and rebuild Sonic's ability to release good games, but it simply wasn't enough, the damage was done in a sense. Sega aimed to try and fix this with a new approach, widening the Sonic series to a larger western audience with Sonic Boom. The game was originally titled Sonic Origins, with the plotline focusing on Sonic's true origins, and how he once had a friendship with Dr. Eggman that completely crumbled over an argument about time travel. The game was supposed to be built around full play co-op play and it was outsourced to a western development team. That development studio would be Big Red Button, chosen solely because the lead developer, Bob Raffi, already had experience with the platformers in the past. He previously worked at Naughty Dog, where he was involved in the development of the Crash Bandicoot games and later on Jack and Daxter, so it seemed like a natural fit for Sega to entrust their most iconic character to a relatively unknown studio at the time. At least they thought it was. This was supposed to originally release on Steam, and it might have a chance to shine on the newer 8th gen consoles if it had the chance to. Sega had already signed a 3 game exclusivity deal with Nintendo for the next few Sonic games, and they had already shown them the vertical slice developed by Big Red Button. This meant one thing for sure, the Wii U was going to be the platform for Sonic's next few games, but for Big Red Button who had already spent time on CryEngine developing the game around the PC and more powerful console hardware, it was going to be the start of many difficulties. Quick disclaimer, the Wii U its not a powerful console by any means, in fact it's, in some cases it's worse than the PS3 and Xbox 360 in some areas, specifically the CPU. Several mechanics including a chaos system got cut, the 4 player co-op mechanic was cut to 2 to fit the Wii's limitations, and Sega began to make major changes to the story by tying the game towards the Sonic Boom branding and diminishing the story's quality in the process. The result is yet again one of the worst Sonic games ever made. I don't really think that this is the developer's fault. Sega was a bit too hands on with this game and it resulted in a similar situation to Sonic 06. Games like Sonic Boo Rise of Lyric managed to make it a lot worse with the game being designed for a system that just wasn't critically, commercially or even technically able to properly give it justice alongside the tight deadlines demanded by Sega. Sonic had received a fantastic 2D experience with Sonic Mania, a game that showed proof that there are developers who can create a Sonic game that can be just as good as the visuals behind it or even better. But Forces however, it has left a lot to be desired. I've played a lot of Sonic games, but Forces was just so underwhelming that I just quit after what, 10 minutes? It all but seemed pretty certain that Sonic as a game series wasn't seen as a barometer of quality and even other Sega series seem to be doing far better in that aspect. It culminated with the production of the Sonic movie. Remember that original design for Sonic the Hedgehog? 
Imagine you're making a movie for one of gaming's most well-known characters and this is the best you can do? Bro just looked unnatural and, and he was like some deformed chipmunk if anything. Fortunately, the backwards was justified enough for the film to be delayed by many months to fix Sonic's design. He actually looks like Sonic for once, I'll give them that. It went on to do pretty well critically and it made around $390 million in the box office. For once, Sonic started to recover from its dark ages. But something much bigger was on the horizon. Hey. Huh. After the release of Sonic Forces, Sonic team inevitably realised that trying to go for a 3D boost Sonic every couple of years wasn't going to be moving the needle. The series had undoubtedly been already damaged by the likes of games such as Sonic 06 and Rise of Lyric. Sonic Frontiers was seen as Sonic Team's last chance to have a go at a big budget Sonic title. Their last big chance considering that their last few games were all over the place in terms of critical reception and they had done a lot of soul search and looking at what direction the Sonic series should take for the next few years. Frontiers took 5 years to develop mainly because they had spent the time to design the game from scratch as well as adapting their internal engine to work in an open world environment. Not to mention they weren't actively reusing aspects of the older 3D Boost Sonic games. You can tell that Frontiers is an entirely different experience compared to some of Sonic Team's older titles and they were actually seeing this as a big chance to revive the fortunes of the Fast Hedgehog. Ultimately, Sonic Team decided to take into consideration the idea of turning their next game into an open world adventure. They already had some experience with Sonic Adventure's hub worlds, but Frontiers would take it a step further with the introduction of open zone areas. To be put, Sonic would be able to explore the mysterious islands that he was looking to uncover the mystery behind them, whilst using rails to explore and traverse around the areas and defeating hostile robots in the process. Sonic Team had fought Sega to try and secure enough time to get the game out in a good state. Sonic Frontiers would have been released in 2021 if Sega had gotten away, but it was delayed to November 2022 for further polish, something that even a few fans were a bit sceptical of the actual gameplay reveal. I remember the internet erupting at the reveal of Sonic Frontiers, noticing how jank some of the combat was and how aspects of the game's visuals and gameplay design still needed some work to do. Fans were demanding Sega to delay the game even further, but it turned out that IGN themselves were playing an earlier, outdated build leading to some hopium. It also helped Sega and Sonic Team that the Sonic series was finally catching some Ws. The first two films had been enormously successful, so all eyes were on Frontiers to really deliver. Newer builds of the game were a lot more polished. For the last time, I did not lie about Sonic Frontiers. The EGX demo was nothing short of being a positive experience all around. Sonic Frontiers released to generally positive reception across the board, and the gamble that Sonic Team had bet on transforming Sonic to a full open world environment, it paid off. Whilst the cyberspace levels aren't the best, the combat, music and boss battles were beyond anything I expected from a Sonic game. This was the game that the series needed to finally move away from the legacy of middling releases. It ranks as one of the best selling Sonic games of all time, selling over 3.5 million units. The next major 3D Sonic game, it's a few years away, but what we do know is that Sonic Team has a foundation laid down by Frontiers and a much bigger budget to work with meaning that we can only hope the sequel can be even better. Today, the Sonic series seems to be thriving far more than it ever has been with a few successful movies, brand awareness being as strong as it's ever been and there seems to be actual hype for the games for once. Sega's Golden Goose is finally catching some Ws. <laughs> if you asked me 10 years ago that Yakuza would grow to be a major franchise for Sega, I wouldn't have believed you for a second. Around that time, Sega had been grappling with what to do with a series that was perceived as niche around that time. Yakuza began as Project J in the early 2000s. The creator of the series, Toshihiro Nagoshi, previously known for designing games including Daytona USA and Super Monkey Ball, aimed to create a game that would accurately give an insight into the Yakuza and how they lived. He also aimed to create a game that would target young Japanese men, an audience that he felt was underserved by some of the games being released at the time. This had also become new uncharted territory for the developers of the game, who had all been involved within various projects at Sega. 
None of them knew what kind of game they were going to create and only negotiated a clear vision for what Yakuza could become. However, this proved to be a taboo subject within the video game industry in Japan. Sega had turned down the project numerous times and Sony was concerned about the violence being depicted in Yakuza, which is an ironic statement considering that it was willing to pay for time exclusivity for Grand Theft Auto and Manhunt, a game that got controversy for that exact reason. But after Nagoshi persevered, Sony opted to give some support for the game's release. Yakuza 1's budget amounted to $21 million, a hefty sum for a Sega game at the time, no, not as massive as Shenmue which cost him the same amount of money to produce years after its release. It centred around Kazuma Kiyu, a Yakuza who took the blame for a murder he never committed and serves 10 years in jail as a result. Once he comes out of prison, 10 billion yen has been stolen from the Tojo clan and the entire Yakuza starts to look for the missing money. The game received mostly positive reviews for its narrative and combat and it went on to sell 1 million copies worldwide. Sega followed it up one year later with Yakuza 2 which also went on to do relatively well. However, the series wasn't able to break out its niche during the PlayStation 3 era. Whilst the game sold relatively well in Japan, it just wasn't able to really do well in the West and it does say a lot considering how little attention Sega gave the series back then. The breaking point was the release of Yakuza Dead Souls, a spin-off game that involved the likes of Kiyu, Go Majima and Shun Akiyama trading in their melee strength for guns as zombies began to overrun Kamurocho. This didn't really pan out well critically and whilst it sold a modest 394,000 units in Japan, by the end of 2012 it only sold around 550,000 copies worldwide. That is an astonishingly bad number for the Yakuza games. Sega took time out and actively considered not localizing Yakuza 5 or any future entry in the series going forward. I mean, they didn't even localize the remasters of Yakuza 1 and 2 for the PS3 and Wii U, but there was a growing fan campaign to get it localized in the West. Sony even opted to help Sega out with the localization, a true strength of its third party relations with the company, considering that Yakuza by that point, it was pretty established within the PlayStation fanbase. After years of fan requests and the intervention by Sony to get the game localized, Yakuza 5 finally released in the West in December 2015. Being that it was a late generation PS3 title, it was only released digitally. By then, most people had pretty much moved on to the PS4, but Sega was cooking up the games that would catapult the Yakuza series to the mainstream. Enter Yakuza 0. This was a prequel to the entire series focusing on the lives of a younger Kazuma Kuyu and Go Majima, each facing different paths and showing how they first encountered one another. The story revolves around Kuyu being framed for a murder in an empty lot, which has already become a battleground for the most power hungry Yakuza within the Tojo clan. Yakuza 0 became a hit when it released in 2017, but what truly set off the series taking off in the West was its wacky sub stories and mini games. You see, Yakuza has tons of side quests available to you in the game world, but a lot of them are just relatable to just wacky as fuck. The replay value in those games is boosted because you get to understand the everyday struggles of some of the people in Kamocha that what they're going through. Some of the game songs became famous memes in their own right. The most well known one, I'll just let it speak for itself. <laughs> <laughs> Yakuza just went from strength to strength with the remakes of Yakuza 1 and 2, remastering the mainline PS3 entries on newer consoles and it concluded Kiryu's story of Yakuza 6, The Song of Life. When it took a huge step further with Yakuza Like a Dragon, not only was it receiving a new protagonist in Ichiban Kasuga, but it also evolved from being a semi-open world action game into a full-blown JRPG. It breathed new life in the series in a way that only continued to grow its popularity. Sega knew they had another hit and they continued to invest a lot in the Yakuza series since. They've remade Yakuza Ishin and finally localized it for the West, and just recently we saw the releases of Like a Dragon Gaiden and Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, the latter which became the fastest selling game in the series. 
It's pretty unbelievable how just a decade ago, Yakuza was facing a steep decline into irrelevance and nowadays it's essentially one of Sega's strongest series. This is the tale of when you actually put in passion for a series that's had consistently good entries throughout and Yakuza oddly enough represents Sega's fall and rise as a video game publisher. I'm going to be biased here, but that's not surprising considering my channel has a Morgana profile picture anyway. Atlas is one of my favourite developers of all time. They are obviously known for the Shin Megami Tensei and Persona games first and foremost, and they are now in the best state they have ever been as a JRPG developer. But what if I told you that back in the 2000s and early 2010s, they were in dire financial straits? Atlas back in the day was not in a good financial position, especially when they were facing steep competition from other RPGs on the PS1 and PS2. It was a little hard for me to find some sources, but they were close to bankruptcy when Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne released on the PS2, and it initially failed to meet expectations commercially. Atlas aimed for 350,000 copies to be sold, but it only sold 270,000. Now, keep in mind, this was just in Japan alone. But after the release of the Maniacs Edition and the eventual US release, it managed to make up for that initial failure in sales. However, Atlas's luck didn't really last that long because their next few games in the Digital Devil Saga duology just performed a lot worse in comparison. SMT3 sold 270,000 units, so it was a huge disappointment for Atlas to see the first Digital Devil Saga game sell just over 153,000 copies by the end of 2004, and the sequel could just barely crack over 90,000 copies the following year. The situation had been so severe financially the Atlas's console division lost a lot of money, and it had been forced to lay off a bunch of people. By then, the director of those games, Katsuo Hashino, was told that their next game would be their last, with Atlas being so close to bankruptcy. That game would be Persona 3, yes, I'm talking about that game yet again in one of my videos. Atlas had to radically change what people expected in their JRPGs. Hashino had concluded that, that if the company was to survive, the entire formula of the Persona series had to change. Persona 3 was seen as Atlas's Final Fantasy. Remember, Square saw that as its supposed final game. It was a game that departed heavily from its previous entries in the Persona series and introduced so many of the design mechanics we take for granted today. The calendar system, the ability to create more powerful personas through your social links, the one more slash press 10 battle system, being able to roam up to your favourite girl and it was a game that took on a theme that's extremely sensitive. It's somewhat poetic that even the ending could have been ironically a send off to Atlas as a company if it did go bankrupt too. Thankfully it didn't because Index Corporation bought them a few months after Persona 3's release and it did really well for Atlas, it set them up for even bigger success with Persona 4 which refined the gameplay foundation that was set up with Persona 3. It pretty much lived up to its name as the PS2's last great JRPG, especially as developers were moving to the more powerful PS3 and Xbox 360. In Japan alone in its first week, Persona 4 sold around 193,000 copies and it continued to sell extremely well. Atlas was on a roll, or so it thought it was. In 2013, its owner ended up having to file for civil rehabilitation bankruptcy because of allegations of fraud. Specifically, Index had to pop up counting by spending money that didn't really exist. By then, there were already mounting debts of over 24.5 billion yen, or $250 million. They continued operating whilst they were trying to find a buyer for their business. Eventually, Sega bought the company for 14 billion yen, whilst creating a holding company called Sega Dream Corporation, with the goal of integrating the Atlas business within Sega. Just as all of this was happening, Atlas began to prepare for the game that would catapult them to the mainstream. Persona 5 was announced in November 2013 with a teaser trailer depicting the game's theme of control and rebellion. It was initially a PlayStation 3 exclusive, aiming for a late 2014 release, 
but as the 7th generation of consoles began to wind down, it was decided by Sega to give the game a much wider audience. Either it would have to die on a console that was already on its way out, or find itself a new audience that would define its successor, the PlayStation 4. The trailers all showed an immediately huge leap from Personas 3 and 4. The visuals were stylish and quite possibly instantly eye-catching from the start. The battle system and combat is just excellent, and the premise of the story took a darker turn compared to Persona 4. It had the potential to finally take the Persona series beyond its core fanbase, which was already growing to begin with. It paid off. Persona 5 is easily one of the best JRPGs in recent years. Don't take my word for it, it's a game that really set in a new renaissance for Japanese games, and we were already seeing it with games like Yakuza 0, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, Neo Automata and tons more released in the same year. Persona 5 at this point sold really well, we're talking about 3.2 million by the end of 2019. This momentum continued with the updated Roy release, Persona 5 Strikers, and the Shin Megami Tensei series really started to grow with releases of SMT3, H3 Remaster and SMT5. But the biggest change that Sega has done so positively for Atlas is to make sure that their games aren't bound to a single platform. You see, when you look at the history of Atlas's games throughout much of the 2000s for example, they concentrated their game development on the PS2, then the DS and PSP when those consoles were doing really well. But it got them a niche audience, and as the video game industry grew, it became pretty clear that they would have to eventually retire exclusivity. The Persona series became subject to this a lot more when Joker got revealed for Smash. It led a lot of people to believe that one day, it might just come to the Nintendo Switch someday. It might finally break free from a historical period of PlayStation exclusivity. And let's not forget King Goomba, the guy has been put begging since goodness knows when. The first sign that Atlas was finally changing its tune was when they revealed that Persona 4 was hitting PC. That announcement was beyond seismic for the Persona series, it finally made that game accessible to a whole new audience. Persona 5 Strikers was not only on PS4, but it was on Switch and PC, and in 2022, the series finally broke free when we were getting not just Persona 4 Golden and Persona 5 Raw on every platform, but Persona 3 Portable also became accessible too. Sega handled all of those ports and it is probably one of the best decisions that they ever could have made because for the first time in years, Atlas was finally able to turn a profit after years of losing money. Atlas is in a pretty good place at the moment. Persona 3 Reloads became their fastest selling game, they've got buzz for all of their comic titles like Metaphor of Fantasio and Shin Megami Tensei 5 Vengeance. Unicorn Overload did it incredibly well. Imagine just how Persona 6 would be. Without Sega really helping out Atlas financially, I just don't think they'd be anywhere near as successful as they are now. They're in a golden age and they 100% deserve it. Don't this costume, I am vengeance. Sorry. You thought I was going to finish the video there. Well, nice try. We're not done yet. Some people have already forgotten about this game even after the news had dropped, but no one could have thought that Sega could have just outdone themselves by investing in a game that they were hoping to bank on the whole life service boom, to the point where it surpassed the record set by Shenmue. That game cost $70 million to develop, and it failed to recoup its budget of course. Now, we're talking about Hyenas. This is a game that cost about $100 million to make, and it did not look anywhere near that cost, which makes me wonder, how? Hyenas started life as Project Keaton, greenlit after the completion of Alien Isolation and then Halo Wars 2. Sega just wasn't keen on greenlighting the sequel to Alien Isolation as they felt that the game wasn't commercially as, as successful as they thought it once was, leading the console team at Creative Assembly to produce a game that had broad commercial appeal. They aimed to get some inspiration from the likes of Destiny, Escape from Tarkov and PUBG, yeah those games. It was one of the games designed for the Super Game Initiative Games that Sega felt would bring in lots of revenue over time for the company. The game was a PvPvE shooter where you had to infiltrate ships to plunder loot to fellow players, specifically old consoles like the Sega Mega Drive and Sonic the Hedgehog figurines. It had a nice homage to old pop culture references and video games and consoles from Sega's history. It also made use of graffiti mechanics that you could manipulate across the ship whilst also fighting hostile enemies called Murphs. Good concept, but in terms of execution, 
that's where things really start to go sour. Creative Assembly were originally going to use the engine that powered Alien Isolation, but they switched to Unreal Engine midway into development, impacting the game's already rough development cycle. Nevertheless, Sega announced the game with huge fanfare in 2022, even preparing a closed alpha to gain feedback on improving hyenas. But despite this, interest just really didn't pick up and Sega themselves were unhappy with the progress that was being made on Hyenas. Sega Japan took an unusually hands-on approach, where employees would be overseeing development every day to see how things were going at CA. I don't blame Sega for doing this. When you've spent $100 million on the big life service scramble, you want to see that work pay off. Even an open alpha test on Steam in August 2023 didn't do anywhere near enough to boost interest in hyenas. Sega had been finding it challenging to decide on a viable business model for hyenas. At first it would have been a premium game, but eventually the decision was made to make it free to play with post launch content planned on the horizon. It eventually realised that it needed to cut its losses and it became Sega's biggest failure by far when they announced that Hyenas would be cancelled in September 2023. This is one of the rare times where it doesn't seem like a publisher did anything wrong at all. Sega tried their best with this game, but it never seemed to have worked out and it's essentially the reason why a lot of their games don't go for the AAA target for the most part. An anonymous developer at Creative Assembly summed up the entire mess. I'm not angry with Sega for cancelling to be honest, I firmly believe it only would have lost more money otherwise. To typically a light touch publisher I guess, because in the past, the studio has been so profitable, I fear those days are now over, but we'll see. I'm angry with the shit leadership and for the people above them for not dealing with them. I'd hope that maybe after Hyena's fought, we could be kept on at CA if the next project was another nice low risk contract job like Halo Wars 2, but most of us have been laid redundant most likely, and I'm okay with that really. What I'm actually furious about is that the redundancies are affecting people who had nothing to do with hyenas, like IT, operations, marketing, HR, even some people over at Total War. They bear no responsibility for this bin fire. So it's pretty clear that Sega themselves were able to revitalize this series in a way where they are now celebrated in video games. But one thing that kind of bugged me a little was the fact that some of their less well known IP didn't really get a chance in the spotlight. Sega started fixing this by outsourcing some of their IPs to different developers around the world. The most significant of these has to be Streets of Rage and Shimui. Shimui 3 wasn't that game just straight up filler? but Streets of Rage 4 was fantastic all around. They produced collections for some of their less well-known games too, like the Virtual On Games. Those got a PS4 collection in Japan, but this is nothing compared to what Sega had been doing now. Sega had the Super Game Initiative where they would be producing games that would net them an infinite revenue source. What they did bring in was beyond anything anyone could have ever expected. At the Game Awards 2023, they were talking about a new era, new energy. Most of us thought that it was a new Virtua Fighter, which let's be honest, it's long overdue a new entry, but they just blew everyone away with the fact that we're getting new entries for Jet Set Radio, Crazy Taxi, Shinobi, Golden Axe and Streets of Rage. It's still kind of hard to process just how much Sega is investing in all those legacy titles that it's had now and they're not really done yet. They're planning for a new Virtua Fighter game and they have new entries being prepared for Panzer Dragoon, Sakura Wars and a new Evangelion game. It took them long enough but they finally got in their creative sparks back from the Dreamcast days. Ever since Sega left the hardware business they've been trying to find their feet as a third party publisher with mixed results in the process, especially in the case of Sonic where well, the quality of its games was just haphazard and inconsistent. But over the last couple of years they've forgotten that entirely to at least be building their IPs and it has paid off. Sonic is finally on the up. Yakuza is one of the most critically acclaimed series and Atlas is on a roll with all the games they've been releasing recently. In 2021 alone, they became Metacritic's most critically acclaimed publisher. I'm optimistic about what they have in store at least. Reviving all of their past series is something I'm really excited to see and who knows what Atlas is cooking. Their biggest game is right around the corner. Now there are a couple of in-depth videos that I've made talking about video games appearing on the screen if you want to check them out. But thank you so much for watching the video, it's really appreciated. Thank you and have a nice day.